now we're going to begin talking a little bit more specifically about uh, symptoms and their sources and uh, principles of management. There are symptoms that are common in bladder cancer, but that are also common in a wide variety of uh, cancers. Fatigue, pain, insomnia, anxiety, and depression are what I call the big five common symptoms that are not specific to a given phase of illness or specific cancer. Fatigue has been demonstrated to be in many studies to be the most common symptom in cancer and in general, the most disabling symptom in cancer. And fatigue is often underemphasized in terms of healthcare professionals uh, talking with patients about this and taking steps to, to uh, manage it. So if you're having fatigue, I would say, don't be shy in making sure that your bladder cancer treatment team is aware of that as a symptom and uh, is a, uh, accessible to help you receive optimal care for that specific symptoms as well as the others. There are obviously, as you all know, a wide variety of treatment side effects from radiation therapy, from chemotherapy, and other systemic and targeted uh, ther agents, and also the surgical treatment uh, impacts, depending on the nature uh, of your uh, disease, may include uh, cystec cystectomy and neobladder and other procedures, which may impact urinary continence, may impact sexual anatomy and function and relationships, as well as body uh, image and appearance and uh, uh, self-confidence. When we talk about managing, understanding, caring for patients with psychological symptoms, I just wanna make the, the point again, because it's really important. In general, every single symptom that individuals have who are going through the treatment for bladder cancer has a physical dimension and a psychological dimension and often has impact on family relationships, as well as having social and spiritual dimensions. So there's not, no such thing really as a purely physical symptom or a purely psychological symptom. For instance, patients with chronic pain often become very depressed. And the depression can often make their experience of pain more difficult to cope with. So in general, as we talk about symptoms going forward, I wanna really make the point that that essentially all symptoms have both a physical and a psychological dimension. And the best care for that symptom often applies, requires really assessing and managing all of the physical aspects, as well as all of the psychological aspects and other dimensions of that patient's symptom. In terms of approaching uh, symptoms from the standpoint of the healthcare system and bladder cancer treatment teams, it's really important to share symptoms that you are having as a patient with your bladder cancer team members, whether it's a nurse or social worker or physician or uh, uh, other uh, parts of that uh, team. I found in my own experience working with uh, cancer patients for many years that cancer patients often want to not trouble their, their oncologist or the oncologist nurse they don't want to be seen as complaining uh, and often kind of uh, underreport the presence of their symptoms and the severity of their symptoms. Uh, but that really is a disservice not only to the patient, but also to the team. If they don't really know and understand how significant your symptoms are, they may not take them as seriously and they may not provide the full range of treatment they're otherwise capable of providing. So one uh, important message I would say is always share your symptoms with your bladder cancer treatment whether you think they're physical or psychological or, or whatever, don't be shy. This is the best way to get best care and to help them provide their best care. And as we said, pri primary bladder cancer treatment teams often have a significant amount of caring and expertise and capability to help manage these uh, symptoms, including psychological symptoms. And uh, we always uh, value them as the first important uh, additional step in caring for patients before we talk about more advanced uh, healthcare providers in my domain, such as psychologists and psychiatrists. Patients with symptoms, not only should you report it to your team, but your team should refer you as if you're having say distress or anxiety or depression or trouble sleeping to the members of the supportive care team that hopefully you would have access to. Social workers are typically, typically the first ones uh, who one would meet with as uh, part of that team, but they should have access to a wide variety 
uh, of other healthcare professionals. If we talk about dietitians or for patients with significant distress, they should be referred to a psychologist or psychiatrist who has specialized cancer expertise. And as you may or may not know, there's a not an awful lot of them around uh, who really have that level of expertise, but that's the ideal of having uh, patients uh, referred to, to psychologists and or psychiatrists who desire and who need that level of care, uh, who where the, the healthcare professional really knows and understands bladder cancer. Now we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about kind of psychological uh, symptoms uh, per se. And as we've uh, uh, talked about, these symptoms are often interrelated with each other as well as quotes physical symptoms. These symptoms may be acute or chronic, and they may be varyingly severe and disabling. Bladder cancer treatment team needs to know about them. And the ones I wanna talk a little bit now are traumatic stress and distress, loss and grief, anxiety, depression, brain fog, often called chemo brain, and often is related to systemic treatment, including chemotherapy uh, treatment. And I simply wanna make the point, I'm gonna make a few, a few times as we go along. Any patient, bladder cancer patient, who is experiencing significant depression and or is having suicidal thoughts and or considering or is engaged in suicidal behavior should be immediately referred to a mental health care professional, depending on your system. It might be a psychologist, it might be a psychiatrist, uh, because one, should never take lightly the awareness that someone is going through that level of distress and having any kind of thoughts related to uh, suicidal uh, outcomes. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about sources of anxiety in bladder cancer. And obviously the, the, the diagnosis itself commonly invokes very high levels of uncertainty and fear about the future. There are trauma traumatic effects of the diagnostic, diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. For instance, scanxiety, which is commonly experienced by, by all cancer patients, including bladder cancer patients. The, the scan procedure itself may or may not be distressing and, and, and cause a certain amount of anxiety, but patients often have anxiety about what it will show, what it means about the state of their illness, uh, whether there is a recurrence or spread of the illness and so forth. So going through di these uh, follow-up uh, diagnostic procedures can be very, very stressful and distressing. The surgical procedures have a wide variety of impacts as we've talked about. And as we've talked about, these uh, anxiety can be related to a wide variety of problems in other life uh, areas as are outlined uh, on this slide. We're going to talk about principles of how to effectively manage anxiety in, in, in bladder cancer if you're experiencing it. One point I want to make again is that anxiety can manifest itself in, quotes physical symptoms. Some patients may experience rapid heart rate or palpitations or feeling of trouble breathing, respiratory distress, or altered GI function with a, a abdominal cramping and so forth. So uh, as in depression, there's a very significant physiologic, physical aspect of the manifestations of anxiety, as well as the psychological dimensions of concern or tension or nervousness or fear, or uh, even in severe cases, what we call acute uh, panic, where a person really feels acutely uh, overwhelmed. If you look at managing it, it's really important uh, for each of us, because we all experience anxiety throughout our life, and we all experience some level of uh, depression throughout our life, that we are able to learn to understand our own anxiety, to be open with family members and trusted friends about it so that we're not trying to deal with it alone. Most of us have learned and can learn ways of managing our anxiety. For some people, it's going for a walk, it may be looking out, it may be a wide variety of activities that one can take part in, in, in uh, re various relaxation exercises, deep breathing, uh, guided imagery, and so forth. So it's many people are able to manage their anxiety very well uh, by uh, techniques that they use on their own. But as we've said, you should always inform 
your bladder cancer treatment team if you're having personally significant anxiety so they can be involved in understanding help and helping you manage it. The important resources of Beacon and, and others are really important. The wide variety of services can help overcome the sense of isolation and loneliness and give you access to peers who may have gone through similar experiences and can provide a lot of valuable actual support, supportive oncology supportive care teams, as we've talked about. And if anxiety is particularly significant or chronic or disabling or overwhelming, there are specific levels of psychologists and or psychiatrist services which can help inadequately managed anxiety uh, that it's wise to be open to if that's what you're personally experiencing. We've talked about uh, uh, trauma and one can have uh, trauma that uh, is very highly specific and one-time event or can be a recurring event as we talked about we're having to undergo repeated scans uh, uh, over time and one can have a wide variety of traumatic stress symptoms that may not rise to the level of what we call a disorder but are personally significant and should be uh, managed including of kind of having uh, memories of uh, an event uh, that are traumatic or bad dreams or nightmares or uh, having triggers in one's daily life that uh, help that cause the individual to remember their trauma and so forth. Trauma and distress related to trauma is often related to both anxiety and depression and maybe related to losses and griefs as we'll talk, and grief as we'll talk about. So that uh, as one attempts to understand either oneself or as if one with the care system that you're involved with, Understanding the role of each of these symptoms and depression is really important and valuable, trauma being one of them. And we've talked about really the principle of loss and grief. I want to talk briefly uh, about all cancers, and it is especially true, I think, of bladder cancer are associated with many losses, the loss of the sense of immortality, the, the concern about the future, the loss of uh, the onset of physical symptoms that are very concerning. Some cases there's financial distress, there's uh, difficulties in maintaining one's work life or other aspects that are important uh, in, in one's life. So loss is just inherent really in bladder cancer and its treatment. It's really important to understand, and this is something I've learned over many years working with uh, cancer patients in, in many set, in settings. One is that the normal human response to loss is to grief. And grieving losses is one of the most important healing psychological capabilities we have, even if the experience of grief is in and of itself painful. Uh, just as we have the ability to uh, recover from all kinds of physical injuries and the body is incredibly sophisticated and in doing that, we have healing psychological capabilities uh, in our life that are critically important. And one of them is the ability to grieve. So I would say if you know you've experienced a loss or are grieving a loss, don't try to suppress it, respect it, value it as a healing process. And uh, for if you have a friend or family member who is grieving, support that grief and help them work through it, not try to uh, prematurely deny or minimize the importance of the loss uh, and the importance of going through uh, the grieving process. Grief is often a major contributing factor to depression. And as one looks at it from the standpoint of significant depression and ways of understanding and caring for patients with significant depression or understanding it within yourself, understanding the losses that you've had and how you are grieving that those losses is really important in self-understanding and it's important in receiving appropriate uh, care. Now I wanna talk a little bit about depression specifically in, in bladder uh, uh, cancer and applies in general to cancer. We essentially all of us have experienced some level of depression in our life uh, and it can be mild and, and short lived or it can be more significant and longer lived or there are patients who have either a family history or a personal history of significant depression, of chronic depression, severe depression, which can be 
severe and disabling, many bladder cancer patients do experience an increased frequency of depression, which occasionally is severe and chronic and can be associated with suicidal risk. Suicide is not especially common in general in cancer patients, although it's slightly higher levels than we see in the general population. And bladder cancer patients have a somewhat higher suicidal risk than patients who have other forms of cancer. But these are not frequent or common. But as we said, whenever there's any evidence or concern about this, it needs to be taken very seriously. And healthcare professional and mental health care professional help needs to be brought into uh, bear. I just want to make a point that depression may be associated with and worsened by excessive use of psychoactive substances, alcohol, marijuana, and many others. So there's a strong interrelationship with depression and use of psychoactive, non-prescribed psychoactive substances. And one just needs to be aware of that if depression is an issue. And if, for instance, some people find they increase their alcohol use as a way of coping with depression, but it actually makes things worse. And as we've already said, people with significant depression or which are suicidal concern should be referred to a psychologist or psychiatrist as rapidly as possible. Again, and the similar principles apply really to the uh, care for depression as applied to anxiety. Become familiar with an expert in understanding, are you depressed? How severe it is it? How concerning is it? How overwhelming is it? Are you coping with it? Is it uh, short term or is it going on for a significant time? Don't bear it alone. Communicate with your family and friends learns depression self-management techniques that are helpful to you. And many of the techniques that are helpful for anxiety are also helpful for depression, such as uh, exercise and so forth. Talk with your bladder cancer treatment team about this. Uh, don't be shy, don't minimize it. Use any supportive care services that are available, such as social workers and others uh, who are, uh, should be part of that team. And again, Beacon and many other organizations, but Beacon especially is really committed to bladder cancer. It's an extraordinary organization and they provide a wide variety of services that can help individual, individual, individuals really recover from depression very effectively with those services. I wanna talk just a little bit about uh, cognitive dysfunction or chemo brain, which is in general, uh, not a rare, problem uh, in patients who have received uh, various forms of chemotherapy, cisplatin is one and others that you wouldn't necessarily have been exposed to, at least not in earlier phases of bladder cancer. But chemo brain or brain fog really describes a situation where a person in relationship to their usual self finds it difficult to concentrate, to focus their attention, their information processing is slowed, their uh, ability to perform tasks is impaired or disorganized. And chemo brain is not fun. Brain fog is a term that is also used. Uh, as you may or may not know, patients who have long COVID, COVID commonly experience brain fog, which can last for long periods of time and can be quite disabling in terms of their ability to perform uh, work uh, or uh, other uh, family uh, and uh, daily uh, functions. So I just wanted to, to, to point out that this exists. Many causes of it exist. This chemo brain can be associated with brain fog with various forms of immunotherapy, including some agents which you might or might not be uh, treated with at various points in your illness. Chemo brain or brain fog is often interrelated with both anxiety and depression. They, they negatively feed on each other and can be related with uh, all of the common uh, physical symptoms that we've talked about, fatigue, pain, trouble sleeping, and can be the side effect of many medications, not only those that are related to, to cancer treatment. So I just wanted to, to point out that this exists, it's real. And again, don't be shy in discussing this with your uh, primary uh, bladder cancer treatment uh, team uh, because they can often help assess and manage this or refer you to other resources to help you cope with this most effectively.